Okay. Well, welcome. Welcome to the media Q&A. This is the last session right before the booth crawl. I just went by there. There are beers, there are t-shirts, the whole nine yards. But stick with us. This is going to be fun. So this, the panel is entitled The Journalistic Perspective on the Past, uh, sorry, on the Present and Future of OpenSec. The Present and Future of OpenSec. Such heady and obscure terms. But anyway, we have an amazing panel. Uh, myself, I'm Susan Wu. I'm the Director of Technical Marketing at Mitokura. Mitokura is an open source network virtualization overlay solution. Not about me today. It's about the journalists and the panelists. So I'll start with Caroline Ken Donnelly. Caroline Donnelly is from Computer Weekly. I understand you're from UK. Any ideas for us? Yeah, I'm uh, the data center editor at Computer Weekly, which is a UK publication owned by Tech Target, and we're end user focused and also cover the enterprise as well as a little bit of um, SME and startup as well. Okay, let's see. Uh, Frederick Ladenois wow. from TechCrunch, US though, not France. Not France. <laughs> I'm very much not French as people like to think I am, but half German and half Dutch. But um, I'm the US news editor for TechCrunch and also cover a lot of our enterprise stories, do a lot of developer stories, but cover the cloud as well. But my focus is... A lot of my focus is on startups and the startup ecosystem, like the rest of TechCrunch, really. Okay. Sean Michael Kerner, SMK? <laughs> that's, that's me. I'm, I'm a big fan of Computer From Weekly e and TechCrunch. I read everybody's mm -hmm. stuff. And I read the news stack. I see you over there. So there we go. Uh, what do I write for? I'm a senior editor at multiple Quinn Street Enterprise publications, including internetnews.com, where I've been for 15 years. I look old, don't I? That's what the gray hairs are from. Uh, and then my stuff is also on eWeek, ServerWatch, uh, Datamation, Enterprise Networking Planet, Database Journal. Uh, and I also manage a small site called linuxtoday.com. OK. Let me set the stage a little bit and frame the panel. So this is about, you know, from you guys, ask your toughest questions about, um, you know, what do you think the present and future of OpenStack? From the media's perspective, right, it could be just as far ranging as anything. So it is an opportunity to ask about like what gets what gets written up? What do you pick up? What's interesting? Every week there's a new product launch. Every week there's a new company joining at OpenStack. What do you see? What do you think is interesting? Um, maybe Carolyn, go for okay. it. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, Computer Weekly, we are end user focused. So for us, the big um, focus is on who's using OpenStack, you know, are there compelling com uh, customer stories out there, that, you know, uh, who's, who's using OpenStack to power their digital transformations, their moves to the cloud, things like that. How, how are people using the technology is most important to us. Um, they don't necessarily have to be um, household names, although that's always great. Um, you know, if, they, if they're doing something really interesting with the technology, that's always going to get our attention. Mm. Well, sometimes we can't mention the customer name, though, <laughs> and they're using it in stealth. Uh, any ideas of what that's, we can do? That's the worst when you ask when they tell you they have so many great customers but don't want to talk about it, and then maybe join us. Oh. <laughs> well, he gets settled. I'll I'll answer your question for a moment about what we cover. Um, our perspective is a little bit different from other publications, I think, simply because we cover a lot of the funding and VC side of the business, so the, the startup side. And then to get into that cycle, it's a lot of you know, funding stories, uh, less than product updates necessarily. So we've got a slightly different perspective. We don't care, well, care may be the wrong word, but we, we don't care about the customer as much maybe as some other publications. <laughs> I don't know. I care about lots of things, of course, but uh, talking about news every week, that's actually changed a little bit. In the early days of OpenStack, that was true. But now, thanks to the, uh, the foundation and the six-month release cadence, it seems to have slowed down. Uh, talking about startups, that's actually something I also look at. But from the other side, I'm looking at you know the, uh, the, uh, the dead list, as it were. Um, and and there, there's a few that are no longer with us, so we can give a moment of silence for our friends at Nebula. If there's anyone that used to work for Nebula, they're gone. Anyone that used to work for Pivotal, I know they got acquired by Cisco, but where did all those people go? Where do all, where do all the people go? They get hired because there's lots of Cisco, uh, lots of Cisco, lots of um, OpenStack 
um, activity. Uh, in terms of things that interest me, though, it is uh, how people are using it in combination with existing technologies. That's one of the things that was interesting about the keynote today, and I wish there would have been a little bit more conversation about that, is how OpenStack is used in tandem with um, legacy technologies, whatever they might be, whether we call VMware legacy or whether we call it non-virtualized server infrastructure, because I think that happens a lot, and that's really interesting, because as uh, people move to the cloud, they're actually not moving away from other things. It's usually additive, so. Okay, I want to introduce our fourth panelist. His name is Yasuyuki Mashushita. Not late, don't uh, worry. Um, no, okay. He's from this Japan. place is so, so, so huge. You know, it takes some minutes to come it took from me one 10 minutes. Here. This is a fine ballroom. Okay, so my, my name is Yasuyuki Mashushita. I'm a freelance journalist for IT industry. Um, I mainly cover the open source software, not only for OpenStack, but the Linux itself or, us, or other, you know, middleware or something like that. So. So this is my second time to, to uh, participate the OpenStack Summit. Last time is uh, obviously it's a Tokyo Summit. So I'm here, so. Okay, stick with it. Um, uh, okay. What do you look for when you write an article? I mean, we're always pitching you. Uh, whether, whether there's a new release or whether there's a point release or a new feature or we're supporting a new project. What do you look for when you're writing? Um, one of the things that the, 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 since OpenStack is pretty much open source and lots of community pe uh, people are gather to create great solutions. That, uh, so one of the things that I always hear from the customer point of view is that OpenStack is, the, the release cycle is so fast every six months is too short to, to be uh, um, engaged with their um, solutions. So, so maybe, maybe I'm pretty much, you know, want to know much about the, how you guys in the community make it software uh, more reliable, more stable, those kind of things. So moving fast is a great thing because more like agile soft product software uh, development, but most of the customers want stable releases for about a year or something, so. Okay, so now that I got you guys in the hot seat, I'm gonna put on my foundation hat. So I, I'm in the ARPR Enterprise Working Group and we're actually trying to get a lot more exposure for the different projects. So if they were in the room, if the whole committee were in the room, um, what would you say to them? How do we gain even more coverage just for OpenSec? Uh, foundation and the OpenSec projects as a whole. Maybe we'll go with Sean. Uh, that's actually relatively easy. There's more than just uh, OpenStack in any given calendar year with the two events. So uh, if I was the OpenStack Foundation or somebody pitching for them, uh, you look at the whole release calendar, whether it's uh, VMworld, Oracle World, OpenWorld, uh, RSA, uh, uh, all the major IT tech conferences and tie in cloud OpenStack related activities or contributions or projects to that. So that way OpenStack becomes contextually relevant in the context of the broader IT industry and not just twice a year. I would echo that, I think. I think there's, there's room to piggyback almost on, on some of the trends, um, you know, containers or something like that where there are co other conferences. The, the release cycle is hard for us as journalists, I think, because there's so much in every one of them. <laughs> there's just, it's impossible to keep up, and it's impossible to really choose what is all that important in you every one of them. You don't want to hear about every Big Ten project <laughs> that, that there is? I, I, I do, but I have to package it for my readers at the end, and my readers are... I still have to, I cannot just tell them, hey, Nova has this or Neutron has this, because they have no idea what I'm talking about at that point. So that, it's, it's just a hard sell to talk about the individual projects, I think. It's just, it's just a tough one. I'm taking notes. Um, I think on a slightly different note, they're perhaps you know, getting to know the publications and the different angles they take on maybe the announcements. So for Computer Weekly, let's say we're end user focused, but then for other sites that might deep dive more into the technology, um, you know, would it be useful for them when, you, when they announce something to have a product manager on hand who can kind of explain the context to release? Or in our case, like uh, someone who's using it, who can talk us through it, so that kind of thing. And making sure you're, you're pitching completely right, um, your announcements to you know, the writers and who 
who definitely covered that technology rather than taking more of a, a scattergun approach and just, oh, we'll fire it off to that publication. I hope someone picks it up. So just really making sure your message is tailored in the right way, I think, is key. Um, the, the one of the things that I want to know that that because of the Big Ten, it's lots of projects going on, right? But the Obstack Foundation has a Jonathan or a Tom is representing their you know current activities. But each project, each project, we need more you know st the leader kind of uh, personnel to stand up and talk about, talk about more about product itself. So it's hard to find the appropriate appropriate person for example for Magnum who's going to be a talks person with Magnum you know Murano those kind of things so uh, I personally know the Magnum oh, yeah, PTL sure. <laughs> so we'll make okay. sure that All we right. arrange right. the briefings but having said <laughs> that right there are and I, I, I want to say like 600 companies in, in the open sack ecosystem a lot of them are startups and if we're all pitching you like the latest and greatest and we'll bring our user it's still quite a bit of workload so what are you what are you looking for because we definitely don't want to mass and email blast and and engage you but um and we'll, we'll do the research we know that the users that you care about users but would it help to try to frame it around multiple project around some business impact uh, what, what are some of the the hot items that we should use to aside from you know party passes yeah, yeah party passes uh, no for me it's uh, like i say contextual relevance but uh I do, I get the best stories when I get a lot of comments back in because they say, hey, this helped me or this helped to move the ball or helped to explain something or was something different. So for me, whether it's cloud security servers, networking or traditional infrastructure, the criteria for what is a good story versus what's not is always the same. It's something that's unique, innovative and somehow differentiated. Uh, the vast majority of pitches in my inbox, probably yours too, are PR persons and there are plenty of PR persons here, so I love all of you, you're all the best. Um, are companies that claim they're unique and the only ones in their space, which is hardly ever true. But if you can still be differentiated in some way within that larger context, explain it as such, etc. Uh, and then also amongst the, those of us here, we're all professionals, uh, or uh, I, some of us are, I'm not, but the rest of them are. Um, we kind of know what's real and what's not if you've been doing this for a little while because everybody gets pitches that are not so good. So you just keep it real uh, and interesting. And then uh, if it's interesting to us, theoretically, it should be interesting to the reader. As a um, news site, um, I would just say it has to be news at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So if it's a point release, is not news unless it ties into something bigger, maybe. It could be. It may be you bundle your funding use with a point release. That may be a strategy, for example. But it, we get a lot of really, really bad pitches that you, know, you get the same and everybody gets the same that don't, they have nothing to do with what we cover, that's all start up the same way. You know, hey, I just read this story that has nothing to do with what we do, but it was really cool, so let me tell you about this one that somebody teaches that in PR school somewhere, I think. I'd, Whoever does that should not be teaching, but anyway, um, it's, it's, it's at the end of the day, we have to be a filter for our readers. And so the pitch has to be pretty much, here's a story that we know your readers will be interested in. If that's not the case, it'll, it'll take me five seconds to delete that email. It, it's, it, <laughs> It'll take me one click to delete that. Actually, I, I won't delete it. I'll just archive it. But mm. anyway, you never know. But it, it's, it's really hard in the startup ecosystem to get through the filter. It's okay. just really, really hard. It takes effort and it takes maybe personal connections or it takes the, the right VC to make the intro or something like that. It's just, it's just, it's, it's hard. And it's not supposed to be easy, I guess. But we yeah. cannot write up 600 startups. So that's why we're doing this panel. We want the, we want the cliff notes. We want the, the best way. And so I'm going to jazz it up a little bit. Is the delivery of the person who's doing the briefing, does it have anything different? Would you prefer a technologist, a product manager, software engineer? I mean, where are the sort of the advice, right? Because that's what we're here to get. We want to do the right thing. Well, we'd always favor either an IT director or an engineer or anyone who can just really give us the lowdown on the technology or is using it. 
Um, but what I often find is um, with OpenStack is that sometimes it's difficult to get engineers and people who are at the coalface using technology to talk to the press. And I think that's, and I kind of get why that is, um, because, you know, maybe they haven't been media trained, that's not part of their day-to-day -day job. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, it's, in a way, it's kind of counterproductive not doing that, because you want the momentum around OpenStack to grow and you want more people to use it. So really, those stories need to be told. So, you know, that would be, you know, if you can get engineers willing to talk to us and people using it, that would be amazing. Well, that's an awesome advice, because I heard from a big tier one company that says for them to be, uh, to speak, they need the VP approval, mm -hmm. just to speak at a webinar. Yeah. So I think it, it is an awesome point to figure out how we could get approvals in advance so that the technologists or the PTLs are directly uh, working on the code and the operators can have permission mm -hmm. to speak. Um, we, we do a fair amount of media training, and almost everyone in my company can speak, down to the SC. Uh, they can speak at panels. Uh, and yeah. yeah, so uh, I want to try something really different, actually. So a lot of the companies, they, they may have you know, gone on the wrong footing with you. Um, so how do they turn that around? I mean, they may, they may have not gotten too much coverage, or they've done the wrong thing, or they've given you canned PR. And what's your advice? I mean, have you seen a company that's really turned it around? Um, they bought me beer. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if they have got on the wrong foot with us, you know, I'm, I'd never close the door, as it were. If they wanted, if, you know, if they said, right, we'll, you know, we'll take you out for a bit, we'll take you out for a coffee, let us restate, you know, what we're bringing to the table. You know, I'd always keep the, you know, the, the dial, you know, the door open. So, I you know, have to ask Sean if that's true, though. <laughs> in, in my case, uh, the wonderful thing is uh, if, uh, if someone was offended me or if I offended someone else, which usually happens on a daily basis, uh, that's why I write about open source software, because there's always someone else. Uh, that's also how I avoid uh, PR people, though I love you all, of course, uh, is there's always open source mailing lists and there's IRC. I am, uh, my handle is at Tech Journalist on Twitter and on IRC Freenode 24-7. Um, and I'll just go around and just do it that way. Because for me, it's not, it's, and it shouldn't be for anyone. It's not a personal thing. It's I'm just trying to get the story and that's all it is. So it's, at the end of the day, that's the only thing that matters is that the readers get interesting bits. How they get it is... Um, how you make the hot dog, and I don't really want to know how people make hot dogs. There's definitely been people who've gotten in, in, in the dark house, I guess, uh, at some point, just because there's, there's some PR people I don't trust. <laughs> I simply don't trust them because they've lied to me in the past, and I will not work with them for the most part. There's maybe two or three of those. But um, for a startup, it's, it's often that personal connection. You know, they may have had, a lot of startups do not know how to pitch. And that's OK. That, that, that's fine to some degree. At that point, then it becomes more about, hey, meet with me at an event like this, for example. You know, have a conversation. And I think that's a good way of kind of bringing it around again at some point. It's, yeah. We, we, we're all here because we want to talk to people at the end of the day, right? I mean, we've got, we all have full schedules, but there's usually a few, even if it's five minutes over coffee, that, that can help to kind of reestablish that relationship again, because that's at the end, that's what it's about. It's a relationship that you're building up, and mm -hmm. bad pitch does not have to ruin that. Is that the same as what's happening in, say, Asian media, Japan, China? For China, I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about China okay. in terms of media. Japan. Sorry, but, okay. but for for Japanese Japanese uh, media is uh, most of the time, you know, pe uh, company creates some spokesperson as a you know dedicated person. But sometimes just conference like this is that you can talk directly to the developers, engineers. But the, at the end of the day, it's hard to get official approval for them to speak out for his position or his work. So it's gonna be a, every time hard uh, headache for me because you know, they talk you know, just like you know, standing at the uh, back of the, the conference room that it's very straightforward why they're doing great job or poor job, something like that. But uh, as an official statement for the company, it's pre very much, pretty much hard to get approval. So. I think I want to see if there are any questions now, but I have a juicy question to say for the panelists. But are there any questions out, out in the audience? 
Well, I can't see. So, so what about crisis situations? I mean, we're talking a lot about you know, happy product announcements and customers who are delighted and want to tell you all the, how great the product is. But what about when something goes bad? And, and the specific question is, can you give us some examples without or with naming names um, of, of situations where it went bad, why it went bad, and how it could have been done better? In, uh, in, in OpenStack, I think the best example is the catastrophic collapse of Nebula, uh, where, you know, I was talking to them. Everybody knew they weren't going anywhere. Uh, they wouldn't tell anybody, uh, but everybody knew it, and I was talking to them every other week. And But it, that's a very difficult kind of thing because th there is no right answer, uh, so you just have to hope that people will tell you honestly. And then what comes out afterwards is if you have a, as a, journalists who have a good enough working relationship, people will tell you stuff off the record. And when it's a crisis situation that impacts people's lives because people have jobs and families and stuff like that, you have to have that kind of uh, respect and sensitivity and you take things off the record, et cetera. And that's when those things have to happen. Um, when a company collapses or there's some kind of, uh, I deal with that all the time with data breaches. Usually uh, in those cases, though, the other thing is you can refer them to a legal counsel. <laughs> and then the legal people will have a legal statement because there's liability issues, but crisis, um, that, that's the thing, you know, it's not just um, products and it's not just, uh, you know, startup money and stuff. There are people who, who lose their jobs, right, and lose houses and stuff. So there's a sensitivity towards that uh, that I take into account. You have to, and, and these are, um, there's more than just technology involved. I don't deal with those situations all that often. For us, most of the time, it's a startup shutting down quietly for the most part. <laughs> they don't send a press release when they shut they, they usually No, they don't send the press release, but we'll hear about it. And it's usually at that point, everybody in the company knows what has happened. So we don't have that sensitivity issue at that point. But you know, this week we've got Intel firing 10,000 people, something like 12,000 people. You know, that's, that's a story you have to approach with some sensitivity, I think, because there are 12,000 people right now waiting to hear whether they get fired or not. You cannot make light of that. But just from the PR perspective, I would say be transparent about it. You know, if, if it's something you can communicate, then just communicate it and be done with it. The worst thing is just covering stuff up at the end of the day. Yeah. Nobody wants to be lied to. Nobody wants to be lied to. Do you want to be lied to? No. <laughs> no thank you. Um, so actually, Carolyn, did you want to weigh in on, on that? How, how to, um, um, what, do, what do we call it? Um, fix up, fixer up or, or something. Yeah, something I mean, happens, you know. the situations I come across probably most frequently that fall into that category are uh, probably instances where, say, cloud firms go out of business or unexpectedly discontinue a service, giving kind of their customers, say, 30 days to move their data. and. Uh, often is the case that we get told that by customers rather than the PR because they will forward on their basically their notice the notice they've been given to move their data and depending on what's happened to the company they won't pick up the phones they won't pick so we end up dealing with the customer point of view and then it's it sometimes ends up quite difficult to get uh, a balancing viewpoint from the company itself because they won't respond to us so we end up accidentally maybe running something that's a little bit more one-sided because the PR community won't uh, respond. So, mm -hmm. so we try to be fair and you know, we, we always are fair and balanced, but it, they sometimes don't make it that easy. I, I've done a poo poo before. I think I might have sent a slide or two with pre release product or a screenshot or something I not, haven't released. So, how often can I withdraw what I gave you? <laughs> <I'm>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we generally don't give you that. We usually tech, give you tech preview <laughs> screenshots. <laughs> I have never you given can, you. You, <laughs> you. You can fix that if you offer, then offer us exclusivity on the, on the actual news and mm -hmm. if it hasn't gone out to other people at that point. Otherwise, if, if it's out there, it's out there. Good point, good point. Um, so actually, this might be a question that I think startup CEOs always ask. They always ask for things like, oh, how do I get into these mainstream publications like Wired, uh, Forbes, Fortune, you know, Business Insider. We, we spend a fair amount of time uh, briefing tech news as well, as well as some of the people that have crossed over. 
because they used to write for tech and they crossed over the business publications. Uh, and any advice? I mean, what, what should the CEOs, what should they expect? Should they kind of balance and figure out and do a little sanity check? Or what should we say to them when they say, I want to be on Wired? Well, I think you have to manage their expectations. Uh, and again, it comes down to, I think, the points that have already been raised around, um, you know, the, if this is an, like say it's a new product release and they've been working, you know, this company's been toiling over it for months and months and months, that's a really big deal when it comes to market. But if you're a news editor with your inbox there and you're getting hundreds of releases all around people bringing out products, it's not gonna, you know, it's probably not gonna float our boat and you probably won't get in that. But it's, yeah, maybe manage their expectations. <laughs> I understand, I understand. Of course they'll ask for it though. Yeah. There's, uh, the reality with Forbes, unfortunately, uh, and there's nobody working for Forbes here, Forbes has become mostly a vanity publication, I think you might agree. Uh, so if somebody really wants to get there, just pay one of their writers and then just go and publish on there. There's a lot of other wow. platforms like that. No, Forbes has a contributor network. You, if you, you are a contributor, you do a thing and you know, that's it. I don't write for Forbes, I don't write for Wired. I spend, I spend uh, more than half my time debunking uh, Wired uh, security stories because they're not accurate. So that's a slight against anybody from Wired. Nobody from Wired here, okay, great. Um, but it's, the other truth is um, ex there's a difference between exposure and where customers read things. So uh, I would suggest if people are really worried about where, uh, where people are reading, it's not necessarily about the big names, uh, they should find out what their customers are actually reading. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter the name, I don't know what the name is, but see what people are reading. It doesn't matter whether they're reading uh, me or Frederick or somebody else or, or whatever, and, and they might find that there's an old world expectation of you know, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, et cetera. Uh, our friends at IBM have mastered the art of getting every incremental piece of cloud news into the Wall Street Journal. Uh, if somebody wants to buy me beer after, I'll explain precisely how that works, though I know there's some IBM PR people here. Um, but that usually works for a certain reason, but not everybody is IBM, not everybody is a mega billion dollar company that's gonna do that, and not everybody needs to, because if you just wanna reach your customer, your target audience, you might do better off in a trade publication. I'm with you there. If you're an OpenStack networking company, maybe the New York Times is not where you need to be to reach your customers. Uh, CEOs want a lot of things. They can't have them all. Just... Any regional differences? Um, you know, to be honest, the, the, most of the, the CEO or, or management type of people are now sick and tired of the United, Sti United States style press releases. They hate all the kind of thing, you know. So most of the time I try to do, to write in the article is that some kind of surprises, you know, why this product is so good or so bad or something like that. So it, it takes so much time to create the software. So every time, you know, the large news corporation like Nikkei or Wall Street Journal, it's more like templated style of everything in the press releases, but we, I, I personally try to be just off the, off the record, off the root of the, those style. So that's, that's, that's one thing I... You, you try to look for something very unique, right? Try to be, yeah. yeah. And so just really different, differentiating yeah. type content. It's very, very, hard, very tough to do that because everything, every press release is uh, you know, written by the templates. It's hard to find another new, unique style, unique thing. So. Mm -hmm. Are there any startups in the room? Oh, that is surprising. There are big companies. You guys obviously have a big PR budget, and yeah, yeah. So like, it, oh, I'm sorry, can you get, I, I'm sorry, I can see, sorry. Yeah, please go for it, sir. For, for me, that's it's more like personal stuff, personal information, more he, why he, you know, he got a little bit uh, 
more emotional kind of thing. So I just, I just wanted to hear from that. Then I tried to create that not so emotional, more like a, um, uh, how can I say that in English? Uh, not subjective thing, more like objective thing. We, we try to write more operational things now. We, we found that people want like hands-on experience with things. So we, we've been uh, doing that. And it's actually quite hard because once you write about some operational environment, then you can't really extend it to someone else's environment. But Carolyn, what, what do you think would, would, uh, would cut through that clutter, so to speak? Um, I think it's maybe someone who, or someone who's pitching something that perhaps goes against the grain of what other people are saying, maybe, some of the, the most popular stories and analysis we end up doing on Computer Weekly are where someone has like, put their ha hand up and said, look, this isn't what we're seeing going on in the industry. And then when you dig away at it, speak to customers, you find out that you unearth a trend or something like that that maybe Gartner or whoever hasn't, you know, isn't onto yet and that kind of thing. So that's, if, you know, if someone's seeing something interesting in their day-to-day, -day, then you come talk to us and tell us about it. That's always going to grab my attention if it pops into my inbox. Like take a very controversial position, right? Everybody says X, <laughs> and then this other yeah, company yeah, yeah. says Contro Y. Controversy, yeah, controversy is always good. Yeah. Without turning it into into bullshit at the end of the yeah, day, because yeah. yeah. mm. there's a danger yeah. there. I'm just going to be controversial for the the sake of it. Mm. And I, I've seen quite a few of those. I'm just, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? I know you're wrong. I'm not going to interview you. Uh, to cut through. <laughs> I've done this for so long and I still don't know what really cuts through at the end of the day. But getting, just having, being precise, pitching the right person that you've seen cover something, those kinds of things, just be very clear about this is the news, this is what's in, I come from the news site more than analysis for the most part, so this is, this is what's new, this is why it's interesting. You know, sometimes three sentences are better than a two-page press release for those kinds of things. Cause you, know, you only have so much time with every pitch, and that decision happens pretty quickly at the end of the day. I'll make it real easy. It's just brevity. Uh, I like mm. the Twitter pitch. If you can pitch me and explain what you're doing in 140 characters or less, <laughs> you're golden. Good. I hate the Twitter pitch. I like my twi <laughs> you don't pitch him on Twitter. That's right. I'll just, I'll just copy and paste what he wrote, which is you know, easy. So at the end of the day, know your uh, press person right before you pitch. Go ahead, sir. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. Uh, let me ask my friends and colleagues on the panel. Since this is an open source conference, uh, oftentimes when we're uh, producing copy for folks in the open source community about the open source community, it's inevitable that somebody reading your copy is going to be more knowledgeable about the subject than you are. Knowing this, how does this fact improve the way that you address the reader in your story? And uh, are you 100% certain that it's improving? Sean? That's a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I know if at least one reader hasn't called me a moron in the comments and I haven't done my job, right? <laughs> right? I, I assume that I'm the stupidest person in the room, but that's, that's where the quality of getting the right person to give me comments on the issue at hand is, uh, because then it's their expertise, not mine. Um, and then the other thing, unfortunately, that tends to happen, and I don't know how much you guys are doing a new stack like that, but when it's something that might be questionable, unfortunately, I'll just drop it. Uh, rather than, than try trouble. But then the other thing is what also happens, and this is why I love it when people leave comments, is uh, in my case, I think it's somewhere between 5 and 10% of the stories I'll do in any given year were driven by comments, not necessarily negative, but things that I might have missed. I'm not infallible, it's great. You see it as an opportunity for the next story, the next lead, et cetera, and to continue the narrative. I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. I mean, I, I just assume, I, I assume I don't know everything. Right. It just but if I didn't, I'd, I'd be stupid, probably. Right. Yeah, maybe I am, but anyway. So, <laughs> comments are very useful for us just to have that conversation with the reader. Uh, we're just redesigning our common platform, for example, to have a, a better conversation. Because right now, a lot of the conversation we have with our readers is, "Hey, here's something OpenStack," and they all go, 
you could work from home for six thousand three hundred twenty-seven dollars, and, and yeah, so that's spam. I responded to that, and it, it wasn't six thousand three hundred twenty. It was about thirty-eight dollars and fifty. Well, it was, it was worth it, but. Um, I, I just, just like Shawn Michael, I think, sometimes when I'm not 100% sure, I'll, I'll tend to just leave it out of the story. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll risk it, and I'm, usually somebody, you, you've got a gut feeling about a lot of these things. I think you know if something work, is right or not right, if somebody was feeding you BS or not. So it just, you know, you make that decision with every story where you're going to go with it. But for the most part, I'll... I'm conservative there, and I'll just leave it out, or I'll just make sure I'll ask a lot of questions. You know, that's really what it comes down to: ask a lot of questions to the right people in the company, and make sure they're not feeding you something that's wrong at the end of okay. the day. Okay, Carolyn, did you want to weigh in? Uh, no, I think not. Okay, good. then I have a question that I, I know my colleagues in the room have asked before, and maybe they've made similar observations. So, for the press, like if some, if a press person would would write an article, they usually don't share it with you in advance. But an analyst, like you know Gartner, you know whatever those Gartner, uh, IDC or whatever, an analyst would generally share the data. What's the difference? I mean, it's still <laughs> about the same kind of. We're giving you the same content essentially. So what's the difference? What's going on? Uh, it's it's a bit of a gray area. I mean, I, we on Computer Weekly we do get requests from people asking. That, you know, particularly on case studies, oh, do we get copy approval? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we always say no. Um, because even in a case study. Yeah, even in a case study. And um, because we like to think that we know what we're writing about, or we have interviewed people who know, who know the area inside and out, so we shouldn't have to sort of send it over to someone to say, oh, can you check our work? You know? So we never, we never do it. So. Never do it. Nope. I, I, that's what I've seen. That's probably the big difference between, I guess, press and analysts. And so many of us in startup world, we wear both hats. So we have to kind of know which is which. So we, we spend a lot of time figuring out your journal, your publication, what you write about. We study you as the way we study VCs. <laughs> Because you're investing, you're investing time not, and money in a way, actually, um, to cover us. So thank you. Um, any last questions before we adjourn? Over here, sorry, sir. I, I would say it's exceptionally unique. Uh, there's never been a project with this many uh, diverse um, goals, as it were. Linux in and of itself has no goals. It's just people contribute in and then it migrates in its own way and Torvalds just make sure that people stay in order. The Apache Software Foundation kind of sort, and Eclipse also kind of sort of tried to do similar things, but never really got the same kind of um, massive uh, interest, uh, say OpenStack has done in only five years. Apache's been around 10, 12, 25 years, depending, 10 on the foundation side, etc. Uh, but Apache Software Foundation I see is probably the closest to what I think of in terms of uh, open source evolution, but there is no Apache stack. There might have been at one point in time for Java, doesn't exist today. But OpenStack is a stack of interrelated, potentially interoperable open source projects. Um, whether it's Apache or Eclipse, neither of them quite do that. So it's it's a little bit different. Eclipse has tried Apache, like I said, kind of, sort of. So this is a little bit uh, unique territory. The other thing that's very different is now, thanks to this big tent thing, which is both a tremendous win and a tremendous um, challenge, is because there's so many projects, what I've seen in the last cycle, at least last two cycles even, are projects that are run essentially as minor fiefdoms by individual companies, and then companies will use them as competitive differentiators against their peers. That doesn't quite happen. Uh, well, it does a little bit in Apache and Eclipse, but that's also uh, a, a little uh, different. Also, this big tent approach is vastly different than anything that exists in Apache or Eclipse now. Uh, with the incubator and, and integrated release model, which OpenStack had prior to Liberty, that was exactly the same as Eclipse. Um, now what OpenStack is following is a very different path, and it's interesting to see where it'll go. 
Sean Michael knows a lot more than I do about this. <laughs> I, I would just say, just in terms of scale and, and the number of companies involved and the way they are involved, it's just, you know, for me, I've, I've not done open source coverage for that long, but it's, it's pretty unique to me. I, I don't see any other project right now, at least, that comes anywhere close. Carolyn, about UK, what's going on? Um, all, all I'd uh, really add to that is that, yeah, I think it is unique, perhaps, uh, mainly in terms of the sort of rate at which it seems to be maturing and seems to be ramping up in the enterprise at the minute. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And ja uh, Japan, long history of Linux. Oh, yeah, because Linux, Linux is more like a more Lin uh, Linux personal project, more human centric, but the, for OpenStack, it's more like organizational, you know, governance is so strong, right? Creating a uh, community with the developers and users, which is pretty much unique for me. I think there's still a question. Oh, okay. So do you guys see um, either Cloud Foundry um, overcoming um, Eclipse as people move more towards the business side? Um, not Eclipse, um, over OpenStack. Because um, I'm wondering, as this is get so big, is it sustainable by itself, or will the business impact of something like doing Cloud Foundry, which is more business-facing, um, eventually overtake um, the kind of OpenStack type of ecosystem? Are you asking about Cloud Foundry itself? Or? Well, yeah, so, so just I conceptually. So let me try re rewording it. So. Will the business impact of something more like Cloud Foundry, which is more business focused and application focused, end up eclipsing the power of OpenStack, where today we care about the OS, we don't really care about the fact that it's running on Intel, AMD, or, um, or an ARM CPU. So I'm wondering, is OpenStack today the same thing as Intel, AMD, and ARM, uh, and it's gonna be su supplanted by something running on top of it like OpenStack? Or do you think OpenStack will eventually grow so large that it, it engulfs things like OpenStack and they become now projects of OpenStack and not separate things? That's a tough question. Um, that assumes that Cloud Foundry will be successful. Uh, and then given that they have an open source foundation, given that IBM, HP, Pivotal, the EMC Federation support it, you might think that they might be. Um, and I think in their next release, they have this thing called Diego, which is more of a container-focused thing. Um, then there's also Red Hat with OpenShift. So absolutely, because OpenStack is fundamentally infrastructure. OpenStack has failed in its efforts to try and do application-centric stuff. So for those that are only interested in applications, yeah, it's OpenStack inside. It's just pure infrastructure. But I, it's not a straight line between Cloud Foundry to um, Cloud Foundry and OpenStack as much as it is between, say, that the Wintel conspiracy where you have Microsoft on Intel. It's not nearly closely as integrated. And I think what people will find is there's going to be multiple use cases, right? So you're going to have the OpenShift pure Docker only approach. You'll have Cloud Foundry approach. But OpenStack itself has no native application generating um, tools. It's not a pass. It's not a, it's not a real DevOps approach. Uh, the other thing that's kind of sort of interesting where you bypass that is, and I'm starting to see this already in the Marantis guys do this a little bit, is with Murano. So people will build apps, then push it to an app catalog, then do it that way. Uh, doesn't really quite answer your question, but hope that gives you some color. You know, so we're uh, getting out of time. So I want to invite each of the panelists, maybe give one prediction about the future of OpenStack. Maybe start prediction future of open stack oh man that's gonna be tough but uh, maybe in the n n near future like two or three years from now open stack summit gonna be in china <laughs> um i think we'll see more and more enterprises using it but it'd be interesting to see just what kind of shape that takes if it is more production workloads or is it going to remain more kind of test and dev um i, I hope it's uh, you know production, but uh, yeah. I suck at predictions. Uh, I'm going to say more enterprise, m maybe more public cloud adoption as well. That's slowly happening and definitely more telco. Hmm. Yeah, m more of, well, the, the, the obvious thing was if the momentum continues, that it would be more of the same. 
The outlier would be, um, and I heard a couple of people talk about this at this summit already in some sessions, is the potential of what happened with um, Unix, uh, where we get forking at some point, because there are so many uh, vendors that have their own distribution that seem to have a particular slant. If some of these interoperability, def core, ref stack kind of approaches do not pan out, uh, then the uh, medium term, three to five year risk is what happened to Unix. What happened with Unix is there was something called the POSIX standard, and then it's split. So AIX, uh, HPUX, Solaris, functionally were all supposed to be interoperable. Once they forked from each other, they never were, and that's how Linux was able to uh, emerge, as it were. So that's, that's the risk. I hope it doesn't happen, but if uh, that's a uh, pie in the sky, bad luck crystal ball prediction. Mm. Well said. So, huge round of applause for our panelists. Sean, Michael Kerner, Frederick, Lardinoa, Carolyn, Donnelly, and Yasuyuki Mashusta. Thank you very much. Beers in the other hall. <laughs>